Welcome, Dr. Peter Wuffley, to uh, this conversation on responsible global leadership. You have been widely published in the area of leadership ethics. You give talks about globalization and entrepreneurship and impact investing, and just recently published a book uh, with Routledge called The Ilia Way, so co-authored by Professor Vanina Faber. And in this book, you describe the learning journey towards sustainable impact. Now, the conversation has a very current topic focus because the world is facing grand societal challenges from global warming, poverty to current COVID-19 pandemic. And we see different actors and institutions that call for responsible leadership. And in light of the broader discussion also uh, at the World Economic Forum, I would like to ask you, what do you see as the responsibility and role of business leaders in face of aforementioned societal challenges? Uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity, Professor Bless. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be here with you in this uh, very relevant uh, topic uh, series. Uh, it's a theme that keeps me busy uh, since many decades. Uh, so leadership is one of my core topics. And uh, what I find incredibly encouraging is that while the whole theme of uh, responsible leadership, of ESG, of kind of impact investing was to some extent a little bit marginalized until maybe five to ten years ago. I mean, it used to be a topic for great speeches at forum and at conferences, but if you're really honest, uh, often it did not have a real impact within the companies. And I think that has completely changed. Within the past two to three years, we see a tremendous momentum uh, and uh, it has really reached the kind of leadership level and particularly the CEO agenda. Leaders today have a responsibility to define, articulate uh, and implement a purpose that goes beyond uh, the traditional purpose, which is A, to maximize value and B, to survive. That's number one. Number two, one of my passions has been ethics. Uh, and within the whole globalization debate, which is one of the mega trends for our generation, ethics has not gotten the fair share of, of focus. But the fact that very basic ethical questions are up for new answers uh, as we have been globalizing because of these unprecedented new ways of liberty that we gained, but also new ways of, of, of vulnerability. And the pandemic is, I think, an incredibly tragic evidence in case for this. It's my conviction that leaders today, more than ever, have a responsibility to articulate what they believe in, what their ethical stance is, what the values are uh, they're guided with. And, and maybe thirdly, I mean, at the end, this sounds very abstract uh, and, and practically leadership takes place between people uh, and how people uh, behave with each other. And, and one of my other kind of guiding principles since decades is partnership. I've made my career, started my career at McKinsey and Company, and there on the first day of work, uh, we learned the principle of obligation to dissent. So it's not a right to dissent, it's an obligation to dissent, uh, and this is, goes across hierarchies. So even as the most junior associate, you were asked to dissent with the most senior director if you felt that the solution was not in the interest of the client. And so I strongly feel that leaders should behave more horizontally than vertically. Uh, and that means that uh, it's the responsibility of a leader to put together a team uh, which shares an agenda, but includes diverse backgrounds, which allows debates, which also, so these are maybe three roles that I see in today's era that are essential for responsible leaders. Now, there are different understandings in different parts of the world around these kind of approaches, around partnership, around hierarchy. Where is the larger group of CEOs standing in this regard? Do you see a larger movement towards being more inclusive, towards being more 
partnership oriented or is this still rather an approach of a minority of reflected and reflective responsible leaders? Well, I come to the uh, issue from the practical side, not from the academic side. So I wouldn't know numbers. Uh, and of course, we have today both in uh, business leadership, but also in political leadership, uh, both tendencies. Uh, and we have the very disturbing tendencies of autocratic uh, authoritarian regimes. We have uh, very famous business organizations in the tech field that were led by autocrats. Uh, and were incredibly successful with it. And so if you want to be a responsible leader, you have to basically be inclusive. You have to reach out beyond your own organization. You have to uh, be comfortable with a diverse group of people, which goes far beyond gender diversity uh, and ethnic diversity uh, and goes into different backgrounds, different perspectives, different cultural kind of characteristics. There are really different approaches, different understandings from, for, from business leaders, how and where one can make a particular impact. What is your particular approach? If you could elaborate a little bit on that, because I think it is quite unique uh, in the sense of what you want to try to achieve and what you have already achieved with ILIA. Well, the first thing to say is my basic philosophy, as I said before, is freedom, responsible freedom. And as a free market person, I love competition. And so I think it's absolutely great uh, that we have competition nowadays, not only at the level of products, product and services markets and labor markets and capital markets, but also at the level of fundamental concepts of what an enterprise is about. I think one of the key concerns I have and what I really struggle with is governance uh, and ownership. And, and I mean, traditionally, Obviously, there is this huge debate about Milton Friedman, uh, what the responsibility of enterprise is, the pro business of business is business. And I mean, I read Milton Friedman carefully, and I think he is most often abused uh, when he is quoted like that, because what Milton Friedman actually said was uh, that if you are employed by a company, you don't have the right uh, to lower prices for social benefits or to increase salaries for social benefits or to distribute profits to anybody. And I mean, he has a point here still today, right? Because if I'm, for example, a beneficiary of a pension fund, I want my pension fund to basically make sure that my pension is secured. And I don't want the chief executive to voluntarily just decide, well, we basically lower profit by half because of my social agenda. And I think this is in my book, a still unresolved question. How do you reconcile governance, ownership and social commitment of business leaders in those areas where de facto the companies are not owned by anybody. Uh, and I mean, if you look at the very large globally listed companies that are essentially owned by a combination of passive funds administered by firms like BlackRock and others, and a few activists who have very own personal agendas that often do not have a lot to do with social impact, uh, it's just not clear who gives the chief executive the guidance. Uh, and I think this is an area where I would hope uh, also that science over time would give clear answers of how to interpret property and ownership rights in today's world with this expectation of society uh, to marry profit seeking objectives with kind of social responsibility. It's easy with private equity. It's easy with family businesses. It's easy with entrepreneurs. It's difficult with large global companies with a diversified shareholder base. I established ELEA Foundation uh, in 2006, uh, and that really had uh, three motivations. One is uh, globalization is the mega trend of our, uh, of our generation, uh, and we now probably know even better than then that this is a challenging process. It leaves winners, but it has many losers. It has people who have no access and no benefit from globalization. And if you are born in Switzerland and have the privilege to make a career as I had, then obviously you feel that you're on the winning side. And I felt a moral obligation 
to share some of these globalization gains with those that do not have access. Second was a passion of mine. I'm an economist by training, uh, and I always felt it should be the noble purpose of an economist uh, to understand what poverty is about and what you do against it. Uh, and so I was incredibly uh, delighted to see last year that for the first time in the history of the Nobel Prize, uh, the prize was awarded to two empirical poverty researchers. And the third had to do with life planning. I, I, I was becoming, I became C a chief executive at the tender age of 44 years old. For me, it was besides what I do with the money, also a question what I do with my life energy. And out of that resulted Elea Foundation, which has as a purpose to fight absolute poverty with entrepreneurial means. Entrepreneurial means is essentially what we today would call philanthropic impact investing. So we invest in companies, uh, young companies in areas such as agricultural value chains, informal retail, last mile distribution, or employable skill building. And we invest with a very strong focus on not only providing capital, but also providing support so that entrepreneurs can essentially realize their potential. And so that's why I wrote this, this book, which was essentially published uh, two weeks ago uh, and which summarizes our learnings. And the main thesis of the book is that in this whole arena of a new, more inclusive capitalism, we have seen two major trends. We have seen a social entrepreneurship movement, which put social entrepreneurs on the pedestal, invited them to conferences, network, created networks among them, gave them a lot of visibility. And that was obviously important. Organizations like Ashoka, like the WEF, um, Leaders of Tomorrow, like the Skoll Forum, essentially gave them a face uh, and, and uh, understood what, what social entrepreneurship is about. And the other big trend was impact investing. Impact investing essentially emerged in 2007 when JP Morgan wrote a study that there is potentially a new asset class that is called impact investing, meaning investing into social impact where profit is one element, but not the only one and not, maybe not even the most dominant one. And by now, also impact investing has reached huge momentum. Uh, we have now roughly 500 billion of committed capital and we have hundreds of funds. And the thesis of the book is these two trends, they are great, they are terrific, and they are very encouraging as uh, potential ingredients towards reforming capitalism to become more inclusive. But what is now needed is to integrate these trends, because what we see is there is often a disconnect. You see entrepreneurs who are not really enabled to make good use of capital, and you see impact investment funds that are not really in a position to really understand the entrepreneurial drivers and therefore to make good use of their capital. And that's what we are trying to do since 14 years, 15 years with ELEA, with a very hands-on approach uh, where we essentially work with young companies uh, in their post-startup uh, period up to early growth period. And we invest about one Swiss franc or dollar in, uh, for every one Swiss franc or dollar that we invest in risk capital, we invest a similar amount into helping entrepreneurs uh, in terms of strategic thinking, organizational building, governance, fundraising, and right now, obviously in the COVID situation, very intensely also in uh, crisis management. Uh, and so that's maybe a, a model uh, where people like myself can, can make a difference by bringing what they have learned as executives in leadership and uh, skills to the party and uh, helping uh, to essentially get the best out of combining entrepreneurship and capital. This is a very new approach, I think. It's, it's really, really right there where one tries to make a difference by empowering people. So it's not about donating money. It's not about philanthropy. It's really... Uh, respecting uh, the individual, really looking into the capabilities that are there, providing them with an opportunity in order to build up their own businesses. I think this is probably one of very few initiatives that really tries to achieve that. Do you have any competitors in your field? 
we would wish we would have some more because there is a, a lot of competitors or not competitors there's a lot of activity in the very early stage in the discovery of new ideas i mean there are plenty of business plan competitions there is today almost an industry of business plan competitions where uh, young aspiring entrepreneurs go from competition to competition without ever having a serious commitment to actually build a business uh, and on the other hand there is right now almost a little bit too much capital chasing too few deals in the kind of more established and more commercial impact arena where as i mentioned you have 500 billion right now and if you ask the managers what they usually say what their biggest challenge is find really good investment opportunities uh, at, at reasonable uh, conditions and what's somehow missing is this part in between uh, which we call philanthropic impact investing where the firms are relatively young but they are big enough uh, that they need a significant commitment in terms of money in terms of patient capital and in terms of support and so our ambition is typically to be the first institutional investor after uh, friends and family and angels and then to develop the company until we are the last philanthropic investor before then more commercially oriented impact funds or venture capitalists come in and in that field we would wish there would be some more i mean there are some where we work together there is a shell foundation for example that has a very similar approach there is a lgt venture philanthropy there is a mercy core uh, ventures in the us so there are a few uh, but uh, we're talking about dozens we're not talking about hundreds or even thousands and in my book this would be an important uh, way because any young company at some stage needed philanthropic support it may not have called it like that but if you look at the venture capital industry and if you take away the top one percent of companies that funds the failures of all the rest all the rest of the 99 percent it's essentially philanthropy uh, we will have some that are profitable we will have some that fail we are very proud when we looked at our track record we have been made 40 investments at Elea in the past 15 years half of them at or above expectations in terms of impact another quarter was positive but below expectations and another quarter uh, was either uh, failures or was too early to tell which is quite a good record also relative to the private equity standards but it's very expensive we go there we get to know the people uh, we are incredibly selective we we, we look at three four hundred uh, ideas and projects per year and then may make three to five investments i'm absolutely convinced that it is a good use of philanthropic capital because and we have learned that as well on our journey i mean initially we also invested into projects like traditional development project work uh, often organized by aid organizations funded by either private or public development aid the problem with any project is you have an employed project leader the project leader uh, has a project duration which may be six months which may be one year which may be three years but once the duration is over and the project leader has left the impact will fade uh, it will may may continue a little bit but after a few years it will basically be faded and the difference if you invest in an entrepreneur and we have a few stories in our book an entrepreneur will not think in months or years an entrepreneur will think in decades and generations i mean those en social entrepreneurs that are burning for their idea they want to make this successful for their generation and even beyond and that's the difference and if you think back about how the successful economies on the planet were uh, becoming successful it was exactly that it was not i mean the us economy the swiss economy the australian economy they were not built by development projects lasting for one year two years three years they were built by passionate entrepreneurs who basically implemented an idea and in the best of all worlds obviously could inherit that idea and that company afterwards to their children and their grandchildren over two three four generations and that's why we call it sustainable that's why uh, our mantra is impact to entrepreneurship because we feel that entrepreneurship is so much more sustainable 
than traditional project finance work. How does it fit together? I mean, you were before you founded Elea in a world that was very short term, that was very profit driven. How was it possible to make this extreme shift into this different mindset? How um, is, was that a journey that was evolving? Was that something that was always very dear to you, that was always an important aspect? Are there two hearts ticking in one body? What, what is the secret behind this? For me, ethics as well as development economics was a theme since I studied. It goes back to my university days. Uh, and in that sense, it was not a, a disruption. I mean, it, it, it was always kind of on my mind, uh, but it's very clear that uh, if you start with a, a blank sheet of paper and with a vision, uh, you have just more freedom uh, to do uh, than if you essentially work with a bank, uh, which has a, more than 100 years of legacy uh, uh, and a lot of expectations from all type of external stakeholders from uh, the public, from shareholders, from politicians, from analysts, from regulators. And there is more degree of freedom, uh, obviously, to implement new pioneering ideas. Looking into where we are standing currently, looking into the business school system, what would you expect business schools to contribute to really developing the kind of leaders needed to not only deliver economic value, but also to contribute to the sustainable development goals and to make a broader difference in the world? I think you're touching exactly on a, on a very relevant point. And when we looked at, after our 10 year anniversary of ELEA, we kind of did a, an intensive soul searching process on what will we do in the next 10 years. And one of the conclusions was that we want to share our insights at various levels uh, with the broader public. Uh, and that's why we then sponsored a chair at uh, IMD, the ELEA chair for social innovation and my co-author in the book, Vanina Fauber, is the owner of that chair. And so that's why we wrote this book together. Uh, this was one of the first projects of this ELEA Center for Social Innovation at IMD, exactly because of the conviction uh, that we wanted to make a small contribution to enable this thinking of social impact investing to become mainstream. Uh, and to not just be hidden in a niche of some kind of a, a little bit strange philanthropists uh, in the venture uh, philanthropy arena. IMD is maybe even more than other business schools focused on, on leadership development. I mean, the uh, mantra of IMD is uh, being best at developing leaders, uh, individuals and organizations, teams and organizations. And it has also a vision to challenge what is and improve it. And I think these are important roles that business schools can and should uh, play. And what I see right now uh, in, in my exposure with the class is, again, there has been huge uh, momentum gained in recent years. And quite frankly, with COVID, I think this momentum will be even accelerated. I mean, it's become so clear uh, that the expectations of societies are for businesses to have an agenda uh, that is articulate and that helps uh, essentially advance on important grand challenges of societies without uh, sacrificing uh, capitalism. And I think that's a very important notion. What still is in some heads, there is still seen this contradiction between capitalism uh, and impact, uh, which in, my, uh, in our experience just could not be falser. I mean, essentially, you need profit if you want sustainable impact. Uh, without profit, you will basically go bust in three years or five years or seven years, uh, and there will but not be any impact anymore. So uh, profit and impact have to go along. Uh, and therefore, uh, one of our contributions to many social enterprises is actually encourage them uh, to emphasize uh, the financial skills. Uh, so often one of our conditions 
when we before we invest we say this is a great business model you're terrific entrepreneurs you have terrific products uh, and a great impact story but please get a cfo uh, who helps you essentially create transparency on your financial situation manage and control the cash flows and uh, have a smart capital raising uh, strategy uh, and this is uh, goes into this whole theme of essentially marrying capital and entrepreneurship uh, and, and this then uh, has uh, consequences like this. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was a pleasure and to have the opportunity to talk to you about these important topics. I hope there will be other opportunities uh, to continue this discussion as well.